Okay, so we've been hearing about uh, we've been hearing about uh, the the human health side of things, which obviously is a huge deal. Now we're gonna hear a little bit about the ecological health and what, what was going on with uh, this part of the world before Katrina and then after Katrina. So, um, Dr. Tom Huggins from UCLA has been coming with us for the last uh, several years. And um, uh, so we, do, we do a class every year. Uh, you guys are all, any students here are encouraged to apply, come to our class. We do it each spring. We, um, we have a, a whole class and then we actually spend about two weeks in, in Louisiana um, over spring break, plus a little bit before, a little bit after. So um, without further ado, are you ready? Are you still alive? I am. So Tom, so Tom runs the herbarium at UCLA. Uh, he's a fantastic botanist. He's worked on all kinds of neat, neat issues, and we've managed to dr drag him to Louisiana to help us with our wonderful estimate. So without further ado, you want the laser pointer? Or not? Uh, yeah. All right, guys. So um, yes, and Sean Ninja now for something uh, completely different. We're going to be talking about plants. Are right, in particular, I'm going to be talking about the English term forests. Uh, their composition is significant in post Katrina New Orleans. Uh, to start, I'm going to uh, show you where the English trick force are. This is a Google Earth image. Oh, ha ha ha. <laughs> now, this, is a, this is a postcard that Sean sent me several years ago. Uh, you got to tell me which one to advance, remember? Okay, oh yeah, I have to say that right, right. Uh, this is good old Louisiana with Mississippi running down the east side. Uh, next to the border with the state of Mississippi and then running down toward the turning sort of veering uh, uh, southeast and going through New Orleans there with Lake, uh, just south of Lake Pontchartrain and then continuing southeast toward the terminus with uh, uh, at the Gulf of Mexico there. Um, here's a satellite view of New Orleans with Pontchartrain to the north and uh, Bjorn, Lake Bourne uh, to the east. Uh, you can see the river snaking through the city right there. Slide. Uh, that big, uh, oh, that's, 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 that big curve right here is uh, English turn. Uh, English, uh, next, next slide. Oh wait, is this the? Yep. Yeah. English Turn has some really nice, large fragments of lowland hardwood forest. Uh, the rest of the forests in New Orleans, unfortunately, are largely gone and are continuing to disappear. For example, um, th this is a video shot. Oh. I think you can go on there. Uh, I came upon this huge clear cut in August. Uh, it's almost a square kilometer of forest cleared for development. Uh, we yeah. was it well, in any case, it's a, it's a very huge bit of forest, almost a square kilometer, that's been cleared for uh, development. And this is definitely not a good thing for New Orleans. These forests provide a number of ecosystem services, one of which is the ability of the forest to buffer New Orleans from the effects of hurricanes and rising sea levels. Both sea level and the frequency of hurricanes are projected to rise significantly in the next <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It's yeah. kind of like a little bit of a hurricane right there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Here, I'll get, I'll get. Uh, Perfect. Okay. So where was I? Oh, yes. Both sea level and the frequency of hurricanes are projected to rise significantly this century. Next slide. Uh, this is one of our contributors, John Lambrinos, standing in two feet of water. That's the beauty of these forests. They act like big sponges and soak up rainwater that would normally go into canals and populated areas. Next. When, rain, when it rains in New Orleans, and it does this quite frequently, <laughs> um, in fact, it gets about uh, uh, 65 inches of rain a year, compared to last year's rainfall in Los Angeles of six inches. Uh, so when it rains in New Orleans, these forests hold rainwater and slowly release it over the course of days, which reduces the intensity of flooding. These are CSUCI students marking forest quadrats in the flooded forest at Delacro, which is a forest within uh, the English Turn Forest. If it doesn't rain, 
this forest will be dry in three or four days. Next slide. Oh, you can see if you can make this thing happen. It's a, another video. Oh. Not only do these forests contribute to flood protection, they are really very beautiful places that harbor and sustain wildlife, including tens of thousands of migrating birds, like this hooded warbler, being banded last spring. But despite their beauty and diversity and the worsening situation vis-a-vis -vis rising sea level and increased hurricane frequency, bottomland hardwood forests are still being cleared. It's like forests are, are treated as if they were unused and without value, simply waiting to be developed. This is a paper published in 2002 by White and Skojak. In it, they do floristic surveys of seven of the most intact, pristine hardwood forest fragments left in New Orleans. Some of these are very small fragments. Next. Uh, here's a better picture of the map. The letters correspond to forest. Forest A is um, airline, H is Hermit, J is Jackson, L is Lafitte, O is Oak, S is Savage, B is Barrett. And um, uh, next slide. And here's English term right there. Uh, now, English trip uh, was not included in this paper for reasons I'm going to talk about in a bit. But here's the sad part. Between the time White and Skojak wrote this paper, had it reviewed, and published it. Next slide. Uh, two of the forests, Airline and Verit, had already been cut and cleared for development. Uh, cut and cleared for development. Next slide. And it looks like Savage was more or less destroyed by Hurricane Katrina. Next slide. This is by Savage National Wildlife Refuge on August 16, 2005, 13 days before Katrina made landfall on the 29th. Next slide. I'm going to zoom in here. Um, those are, canopy, are tree canopies, more or less continuous. This is by Savage on September 7th, eight days after the storm. The whole forest is underwater, salty water. But here's a closer view. That's water completely covering the forest. Those white marks are waves. And this is by Savage five months later, in February 2006. Here's a closer view. Uh, the forest is completely trashed. The trees are down and completely defoliated. Next. This is 2014, nine years later, and you can still see this large brown spot. The forest is still trashed, probably as a, a, a result of saltwater flooding from, from Katrina, at least according to the director of the refuge. Next. So now, uh, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to be focusing on English turn and the composition and structure of the forest there. English turn is basically a tongue of land created by these two sharp turns in the Mississippi here and there. Um, it's, uh, it's bounded by the west, to the west by the Industrial Canal. It's bounded uh, to the south by this community of Belle Chase. And um, let me see, next slide. Here it is basically. As you can see, the forest has been heavily impacted. Here's a golf course. Uh, there's a little community over here. Um, and there's the military and stuff around here. And there's a, a lot of suburban encroachment to the north right here. Next slide. Uh, I'd say over 50% of the English turf forest has been developed or degraded. Uh, the good news is that uh, uh, that close to 50% of the forest is more or less intact in these three large patches that I call the Southwest Forest, the Triangle Forest, and the Northeast Forest. And the nice thing is that they're almost uh, continuous, almost continuous, which has the important biological, which has important biological significance for animal dispersal. So together, they're a relatively big chunk of forest and a good, um, good target for conservation efforts. In fact, two large patches are currently being managed as reserves. Uh, Woodland Trails and Delaware. We're writing a paper about the floristics of these two preserves and comparing them to the forest sampled by White and Skojak. Uh, last year, we set up some plots in Delaware, uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking. That's what I'm 
going to show you now. Um, here's a closer view of Delacro. Uh, these are the location of eight 20 by 20 millimeter plots we sampled last year. We sampled trees and the understory, but I'm just going to be talking to you about tree data today. We need to do at least four more plots, probably, you know, in this, this, empty, this empty area here. And forgive me for this table. These, this is not big enough for you to see. Uh, but let me just go through it quickly. This is a list of tree species from woodlands and Delacro to which we've collected, for which we've collected herbarium specimens. We collected 30 species and 22 genera and 17 families. These are in alphabetical order according to family, then genus, and then species. We collected over uh, several weeks on several different trips. Some of these species are really rare, like Ladensia tricanthus and Populus deltoides, which, for which we only found one specimen. Actually, last spring we found three new specimens to add on this list, but we haven't added it yet. So that makes 33 tree species in this forest so far. Uh, this is data from the eight plots we did at Delaware. <coughs> These are in order of abundance or essentially density. And as you can see, there are a lot fewer species. There's only 15 species on this list. We lump the fractions because they're difficult to, dis to distinguish. And since we're essentially subsampling the forest, the rare species drop out. So we're trying to characterize a forest, use a, a forest using abundance and density can be misleading because a lot of small individuals can look more important than a few really large individuals that are more dominant in terms of mass or volume. So foresters have come up with this measure they call importance value. Next slide. Uh, and uh, a species' importance value is a combination of the species' relative density plus its relative basal area. And basal area is just the cross-sectional area of the tree. Breast height. These are importance values for Delacro on the left, and then to the right, the white scojack forest. The last column contains the means from all the white scojack forest, and it doesn't include Delacro. Uh, the bold numbers are the top three species in each forest. Delacro differs from these forests in some significant ways. Next. This slide? Or the next one? Uh, next one. Uh, check out the means here. The top two species in the White and Skojet forest right here don't even occur in the plots of Delacro. That's Quercus virginiana and Salsa slavigata. That was kind of surprising. Next slide. Acer rubrum, red maple, is the dominant species in our plot at Delacro, but only oak has similar Acer rubrum dominance. But the similarity between Delacro and oak is there are second and third dominance, uh, Taxodium disticum, and Fraximus are ne negligible in oak. 3.510. Next slide. In fact, our second dominant, Taxodium disticum, bald cypress, you might have heard of it is a tiny component of the floras of these other trees. And bald cypress is really a huge and majestic tree that has great economic and cultural value in, in New Orleans. It's the only cone-bearing tree in the flora. It's a gymnosperm. The other trees are all angiosperms, flowering trees. Next slide. And our second dominant, Fraxin, is, is similar only to airline, which has been cut down. So it really looks like Delacro is very different floristically from the seven forests that White and Skojak surveyed. The question is why? And I think the answer to that question has to do with the history of land use and hydrological modification in the, in the English Turn Forest. Next slide. These are the English Turn Forest today. <coughs> Next. Um, it's mature bottomland forest with a closed canopy between 25 and 40 meters high, but it wasn't always like that. This is a map of English Turn published in 1803 and hanging on the wall in the historic New Orleans collection, a wonderful museum in the French Quarter with an excellent research facility. What this map shows is the original vegetation of English Turn was stratified. Uh, with forest along the Mississippi, here, and along the major bios. And with an interior, which is labeled prairie, which is like a, a, a wetland marsh with uh, dominated by grasses. A marsh something like this, next slide. This is a marsh about eight miles east of, of English Turn. This is the kind of distribution of vegetation
vegetation created by levees. Levees are ridges along riverbanks. They can occur naturally, or they can be built to contain river or canal during flood stage. This is New Orleans, and this is Steve Nelson explaining to the uh, CSUCI students how this levee back here uh, broke during Katrina. This is an artificial levee with a concrete flood wall on top. And this is a natural levee built to contain the Donner Canal that drains English Turn. Uh, but le levees can also occur naturally. This is the initial condition, a river within its banks at low seasonal water levels. Here's the river at flood stage. At flood stage, the largest, heaviest soil particles suspended in the floodwaters get deposited closest to the river. And the lighter, smaller soil particles are deposited further away. This one. Oh, yeah. One more. Here we go. Uh, and so, uh, after many floods, natural levees form along the riverbank with, with soil elevation higher along the riverbank and then decreases as you go left. There. These are not huge changes in elevation, maybe two or three meters at most, but even small differences in elevation around sea level can have big effects on the amount of water in the soil. The soil at higher elevations, next one, next one, there we go. The soils at higher elevations, uh, soils at higher elevations drain toward lower elevations where water is accumulated. At this, and this gradient in soil water affects plant distributions. Plants that can tolerate lots of soil water, like marsh plants, grow here. And plants that require drier conditions, like trees, grow here on the elevated level. And this is exactly what you see represented in this 210-year-old map. Um, Water is draining away from the Mississippi, perpendicular, perpendicular to the river's natural level. Accumulating in these wetlands here, and flowing south along these major bayous. And the plants are distributed, as you'd expect, expect across the soil moisture gradient. The trees on the elevated levee, along the Mississippi, and the larger bayous, and wetland grasses in lower elevation soggy interior. Now when I first saw this map, I couldn't figure out quite what these long straight things were. It looks like the forest has been cleared for development, and there's some houses there. But I couldn't figure out what these, what these long straight things were. Well, it turns out they're actually canals. It says so right down here. Next one, Sean. It's Canal de uh, something there. I think it's <laughs> probably family name. Um, so, uh, but the big question is, if these are canals, what are these canals for? They only occur in areas that have been cleared, and they generally, generally run from the Mississippi through the cleared area into the forest, and sometimes through the forest belt into the marshes. And sometimes they connect to bias, like right here and up here. My current of his opinion is that their drainage canals intended to drain water off this cleared area for cultivation and habitation. Next one. These methods are still used today to drain and dry the land. This area in Delacro, right, this is Delacro right here, and above it is this suburban development. Remember, water runs, flows perpendicular to the levees in this direction. Um, in this picture, uh, you can see how the developers of these properties have drunk, done a series of small canals to drain this property, right here, you see it? Uh, into this larger canal down here. And this larger canal, you can see it right over here, drains into here, and this canal going, oh, I can't quite get it. But this runs into the the, this canal that it intersects with runs into the golf course. And then, from the golf course, it runs through this canal, into this canal, and over into this large canal, into a pumping station. 
That's the industrial pit. At this massive pumping station that can pump millions of gallons of water per day. What this means is that the water flowing out of the development, which would normally accumulate in the center of the peninsula, in the center of the peninsula, is being pumped into the river. Here we are back in 1803. This is 90 years later. This is a US Geological Survey topographical map from 1892. Sorry for the quality there. The canals are still present here. You can see that the canals are still present, one or two things. But the forest has been more or less cleared. Um, probably for cultivation, probably sugar cane. There's a, a railroad there now that was probably shipping the products of its cultivation. Now, while the forests are gone, the interior marsh is still present. And here we are 40 years later. This is another USGS map from, 18, from 1935. And it looks like in this one, I don't know if you can make that out, but the, all of the, looks like the, the interior marsh is now gone. And this is how they did it. They built three serious canals. The Norman Canal, the Daughter Canal, and the Planters Canal. It's hard to see in um, uh, we're still investigating this time period, but one of my collaborators, Katie Gracehead, thinks that this, the, they drained English term for two reasons, agriculture and yellow fever. New Orleans, New Orleans had been plagued by yellow fever epidemics throughout the 19th century. Next. And yellow fever is transmitted by this mosquito, Aedes aegypti. Now, mosquitoes require standing water in their larval stage. And so we think the English term marsh was drained to, in part to prevent the scourge of yellow fever. So this, this mosquito is kind of like a metaphor for what we did to English term. We sucked the marsh dry. <laughs> but on the flip side, in the marsh's place, there's an incredibly beautiful and wonderfully diverse forest that supports lots of wildlife and allows the people of New Orleans, researchers and students, the opportunity to interact with that wildlife. The English Dirt Forest is not a pristine, naturally occurring forest like the forest White and Sojad surveyed in 2002. It's like, a, it's like a hybrid forest, a product of the natural processes of plant dispersal and succession in a hydrologically modified ecosystem. Um, and unless we backfill the canals and blow up the pumping station, it's never going to be a marsh again. <laughs> but the English Turn Forest provides one, um, many of the ecosystem services that marshes do, including buffering the city of New Orleans from increases in hurricanes and sea levels predicted by climate change models. Despite these important functions, forests around New Orleans are, around New Orleans, forests around New Orleans are still being cut down. And the English Turf Forest is constantly under threat, most recently from a proposal to cut it down to build a baseball facility. Without massive intervention, the prognosis for New Orleans at the end of the century is grim. Saving and growing forests is a cost-effective way to help save the priceless American treasure, which is the cultural and human legacy of New Orleans. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you. My collaborators, my institutional support here, and my my help in the field. Thank you. Cool. So we, we we're running a bit long here. So, but if you guys have a question too for Tom, that's great. Uh, I should say that before before we started doing this, it was probably about uh, 45 miles from the Gulf of Mexico to the city of New Orleans um, before you hit water. Now it's about 14 miles. So, um, so this stuff is really key. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to make a comment. I really appreciate your presentation because I grew up in New Orleans. I grew up uh, where my grandmother lived in Big Bend, Louisiana, where the, le the levees formed, the natural formation of the levees. And yeah. the way you explained it was. We know what's your name? <laughs> what's your name? <laughs> Excuse me? What's your name? I forgot. My name is Rosa. She told me that she, your grandparents were the 
first residents my, of the Lower Ninth parents, Ward, is that right? No, my parents. Your parents? Were the first, first people. family to live, to move to the uh, Lower Ninth Ward in wow. 1924. Wow. Whoa. And I've just that written, is a heart I've in the war. <laughs> So, so we were going to break for an hour for lunch. I think we yeah, should let's break. come back at 1.30, right? We'll go 45 minutes.